Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to all of you for joining the session today, which is part of Wales MIT Virtual Conference Series. My name's Carrie Ann Quinn and I'm the Chief Executive of the Life Sciences Hub in Wales. I'm absolutely delighted to host today's session on behalf of Welsh Government. Um, as many of you will know, MIT is one of the world's top research and academic institutions with globally renowned expertise in areas such as technology, engineering, science and leadership. It also boasts 93 Nobel laureates amongst many of their other accolades. And research has shown that MIT alumni have launched over 30,000 companies around the world, employing over 4 million people and generating almost $2 trillion in annual reserves. Fab fabulous track record. Um, and as you might expect, many global businesses seek to partner with MIT, including familiar names like Google, Shell, Intel, Samsung and Siemens. Businesses here in Wales are also able to directly uh, engage with MIT through the Welsh Government membership of the Industrial Liaison Programme, uh, which has made today's session possible. Uh, so this includes access to the latest online research and, and resources, some webinars and bespoke meetings with MIT faculty on specific areas of interest. The Welsh Government also provides support to businesses in attending flagship MIT conferences and these are currently being delivered online due to COVID-19, but we all hope we'll be able to return to MIT's facilities in the near future. There's absolutely no doubt that the last two years have seen the landscape change immeasurably for health and care during the pandemic. Um, with it came challenges, but also opportunity. And we've seen health and care, academia and businesses really unite to embrace a common vision and mission to introduce transformative innovations at pace and scale like we've never seen before. These collaborative efforts have not only helped us through the pandemic, but they've actually provided a glimpse of what is possible in health transformation when everybody is working together to a common goal. Our work at the Life Sciences Hub Wales engages closely with health and social care, academia and industry to accelerate the development adoption of innovative solutions for the better of health and well-being. That broad agenda works to promote uh, in a collaborative way by working to develop and deliver innovation in healthcare um, and we run a broad programme of work across a spectrum of, of subsectors including digital, artificial intelligence, precision medicine and advanced therapies. It's been a real privilege to get to work with amazing health innovators and industry partners every day. And that work each day is different. One day we may be working with health providers to develop a business case to bring forward a new piece of technology um, that we hope will, will improve the quality and efficiency of clinical outcomes. Another day, we may be meeting with a global company to plan how they can expand, expand their company and their footprint here in Wales. And we also uh, work to provide support to researchers and innovators who are looking for advice to develop new health products. And it's thinking of that research that I am absolutely delighted to introduce today's session with Ellen Roche, who will be delivering her talk on augmenting dynamic organ functions with device-based approaches. It's, it's widely acknowledged that women are underrepresented in, in STEM, um, at universities and in the general workplace. And recent data shows that women make up only 35% of STEM students in UK universities. Whilst there's been some gains, there really is still much to be done in this field. And we really hope that by sharing Ellen's journey and her career success, we can expire, inspire and promote the diverse opportunities that are available to women right across STEM. 
So Ellen received her bachelor's degree in biomedical engineering uh, in NUI Galway in Ireland and went on to work in medical device industry before receiving her MSc in bioengineering from Trinity College in, in Dublin. Um, and she completed her PhD at Harvard University. To date, her research has focused on new approaches to cardiac device design. In industry, she worked on embolic cardiac filters, um, drug chronology stents and um, trans sorry, a trans aortic uh, valve bioprothetics uh, delivery systems. Ellen, Ellen will, will tell you more about this far more eloquently uh, when, we, when we hand over. Um, she directs the Therapeutic Technology Design and Development Lab at MIT. <coughs> and since the creation of her lab, uh, she's explored the intersection of mechanical and biological therapy delivery. So, for example, her group has des described ways to modulate immune response using dynamic actuation and pioneering methods for coupling a direct cardiac compression device to the heart using native biological response. So I'm sure, like me, you're going to be fascinated to, to hear Ellen's talk. Um, and please feel free to add any questions that you may have during the talk into the chat. Um, and at the end of the session, we'll try and get to as many of your questions as possible. Um, so with that, let me please hand over to Ellen and thank you very much. Hi, good morning, uh, everyone. I, I guess it's good afternoon there, but uh, morning time for us. It's uh, my absolute pleasure to be here today to discuss some of my research with you, and I am very grateful for the invite um, to this series for celebrating women in science and engineering. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about my research, um, which I've titled here, A Moving Target, Augmented Dynamic Organ Function with Device-Based Approaches. Um, before I get into the research discussion, I'd first like to uh, point out that this research wouldn't be possible without my fantastic group. We're here at a, a game, Level 99 it's called, it's a, a game um, event here in, in Boston this summer. Um, and really these are the people that have done all the work that I'm going to discuss today, so I'm very lucky to work with them all. Um, just to give a little bit of background about my journey because uh, you know, I, I think everyone's journey is different. My particular journey went um, between Ireland uh, and the US quite a bit. So I started off um, in, uh, in Ireland. Um, I went to uh, the US twice during my uh, my college education once to work as a, as a lifeguard and another time to work in an Irish bar in Chicago. But I really enjoyed um, working in the US. Um, then after graduation, I got the opportunity to go to California to work in Abbott and I worked on some uh, stents there and some, some heart valves. Um, um, and then I went back to Ireland and I did a, a, a master's in bioengineering. My undergrad was in biomedical engineering. And upon finishing my master's, I applied for a Fulbright fellowship um, to go to the US. Um, and I was lucky enough to secure that, and that got me um, a place on a PhD program at Harvard University, which uh, was incredible. And that's where I kind of applied some of my research skills that I had learned in industry on cardiovascular devices, but learned some new techniques on uh, things like soft robotics and tissue engineering that I will discuss with you today. After that, I went back to Ireland again for a postdoc and then eventually came here to MIT. I started my research group here in 2017, so I'm almost five years um, at MIT now and since then have been able to um, start a wonderful group of people and start the lab and do some exciting work that I'll share with you today. Um, but just kind of to point out that it's a lot of over and back and it's not always a smooth journey, but uh, I think, you know, I was lucky to get these opportunities and to kind of trust and go for them and uh, uh, that got me to where I am today. Uh, okay. As well as that, I had three girls along the way, so I'm, I'm happy that uh, this is about women in science. My girls also love science. Lily was born in Ireland. This is Sarah because she was born right after I moved back here. And then recently, Isabella was born here. So two little American girls and one Irish girl. <laughs> 
Um, okay, so I'll jump into my research now, um, and um, this is where we start to talk about what we actually do in the lab. So my research focuses on dynamic organs, um, like the heart and lungs, and these organs are in constant motion. And that you can see the heart uh, on, on the video on the right. Um, it has very complex tissue architecture. And this is a result of, of composite mechanical properties. You can appreciate the different um, tissues that are in the, in the vessel there, in the fatty layer, in the muscle. Um, so this makes them work, but it also uh, creates a lot of challenges when they become impaired or when they don't work as well as they should, because supporting them is quite challenging as well. Um, the approach we take um, is to use dynamic actuation and soft robotic techniques to augment organ function. Soft robotics are a branch of robotics where soft or elastomeric material is used. We design bioactive implantable devices that allow replenishable therapy delivery so we can refill therapy on demand and it can also be shown to change the immune response so decrease the amount of foreign body response um, in the host. We also use similar soft robotic approaches to reanimate tissue uh, so that we can recreate on the bench what will happen eventually in the body and we can do very high fidelity testing. We need to use a lot of tools to do this work. We need a deep understanding of the pathology, the disease and the physiology and the biomechanics. We also use advanced imaging approaches. Here we show um, a specific type of MRI where we can look at the muscle fiber orientation. We use a lot of computational models, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. And we use advanced materials and robotics. Uh, my research is divided into four main themes. Um, the first is augmenting organ function. So um, the second is repair or replacement of focal deficits. The first is at the global organ scale. The second is at the tissue level. The third is organosynthetic simulators. Uh, these are benchtop recreations of the actual um, physiology. And the fourth is computational models. And today I'm just going to give a case study from each of those research strands so you can appreciate the type of work we do. These are all interrelated and they're not um, standalone uh, research topics. They definitely are, are related to each other. So starting with augmenting organ function, one of the um, projects that I worked on during my PhD was called a cardiac compression device. This was a device to treat heart failure. Heart failure is when the heart can't pump enough blood to meet the demands of the body. Um, at end stage heart failure, when medical therapy has been exhausted and won't work anymore, um, patients often wait for a heart transplant or they wait for this device shown on the bottom left here called a ventricular assist device uh, or a left ventricular assist device or LVAD. This can cause some tissue damaging and does pose a risk of um, blood contact, of uh, clotting because it's blood contacting. It pump, pumps the blood um, for the heart and takes over the heart function. We proposed a solution um, that looked more like a sleeve that goes around the heart. It mimics the native contraction of the heart and it augments uh, cardiac or heart function without replacing it. So it works with the native muscle and pumps the blood with it. Uh, but it never contacts blood, so it um, significantly reduces the risk of clotting, which can lead to stroke. We were able to, um, and my doctoral work, we were able to um, put this on a, a, a heart, um, and then we, when we um, when we actuate it, oh sorry, the video is playing there, but um, when we move this, um, let me try that again so you can see it in action. Um, when you move the muscles, you can see that it gives um, extra assistance to the heart. Um, at baseline, uh, the cardiac output is the amount of, of blood pumped per minute. Um, so you can see for, for this uh, study, it was up to close to around three. And then we gave this drug that reduces the contractility of the heart. So the heart function went down to about half of its normal level. And then we put the sleeve on and actuated it and we were able to bring it back up to baseline and we were able to do this repeatedly. So that was really exciting for us uh, to know that we could augment cardiac function in that way. 
Um, when I started the group here then, we um, changed the design quite a lot. We used a medical mesh material to make the heart sleeve. Um, this allowed us to really tension it to the right degree and we worked with surgeons to do that. Um, we showed that coupling the sleeve to the heart tissue by letting the tissue grow into it uh, reduced, uh, resulted in greater functional improvement. Um, and we showed that we could get sort of a bio-integration, so when the cells actually grow into the mesh material. Um, this more efficient coupling improved the performance. So you can see we have a number of um, active elements. These are similar to small little balloons that you can inflate and deflate, which uh, help the heart to contract. And they're also helical balloons that help the heart to twist, um, which it does naturally as well. Uh, on the bottom left, you can see we were able to even improve the function at slightly above baseline with this efficient coupling and this lightweight textile device. Another device we worked on is a diaphragmatic assist device. This is for patients that have respiratory muscle weakness. So if they have conditions such as degenerative muscular disease or paralysis, sometimes the diaphragm doesn't work. And the diaphragm is the major muscle that drives pump function. If um, patients are at uh, end stage respiratory failure or can't breathe at all, they often have to go on artificial ventilation. Um, this can be non-invasive or invasive, uh, but either one significantly affects the quality of life because you have either a mask over your face or a tracheostomy here. Um, we propose a different approach to this and it's involving putting soft robotic artificial muscles over the diaphragm that help to move the diaphragm. Um, so this would preserve key aspects of quality of life because there would be no mask or tracheostomy. Uh, we went about looking how we would design these um, muscles, how we would implant them and how we would power them. The first piece of work is tracking motion of the diaphragm and this MRI scan is from, um, from a patient where you can see it's moving and right underneath that is the diaphragm. So we can, <clears throat> we can output and measure the trajectory that the diaphragm takes and then we design these uh, artificial muscles in a very specific way so that they follow that motion trajectory and we have an algorithm that allows us um, to input the motion trajectory and this will um, inform how we design the actuators. Then we make them in the lab here by using 3D printed molds and we cast them in silicone and we reinforce parts of them with fibers so each segment behaves differently either elongating or bending uh, or contracting. Uh, so overall, you can you can really replicate the motion um, on both sides of the diaphragm, and that's shown here in the bottom where you see that the actuators will move. Um, okay, maybe that video wasn't working. The actuators should move along at the same pace as the uh, as the diaphragm and follow the same trajectory. So we tried to do this in a preclinical animal model where we. Um, we could put these muscles above the diaphragm um, when they're unpressurized the and they're unpressurized when the diaphragm is relaxed during expiration and then when they're pressurized they help the diaphragm to contract like during inspiration we were able to instrument we use a, a pig model here because this um, model is is very relevant for the human size. Um, we have a ventilator and we can measure flow, volume and different pressures. Pressures in the actuators and pressures in the thorax and the abdomen. Um, we were able to induce different types of respiratory failure, both from just depression, a respiratory depression, so um, a, a little lower function by using anesthesia to full um, paralysis um, by severing the nerve. Uh, and what we can show here is that when we power these muscles, these artificial muscles that sit above the diaphragm, where it says on there, these muscles are powered and you can see the pressure peak. So we, we um, sequentially power them uh, cyclically um, in sync with the breathing motion. And what we can show is a huge in increase in the flow that comes into uh, the lungs and the volume of air that comes into the lungs when the device is on compared to when it's off, when both the flow and the volumes are a lot lower. When we turn it back on again, we can increase the flow and volume. So really what we're showing here is that without using anything, any mechanical ventilator to push air in, um, or use positive pressure to push air into the lungs, we can increase breathing function and rescue, um, rescue ventilation. 
So I'll switch to another research stream where we repair uh, or replace focal deficits. Um, one example here is a cardiac patch. Uh, so um, there is a congenital heart disease called uh, ventricular septal defects where babies are born with a hole in the septum or the central wall of the heart. Uh, if this is above a certain size, you get mixing of blood that has oxygen in it and deoxygenated blood, and this can have uh, negative effects on the child. So uh, often this is um, repaired either surgically, but surgical repair is invasive and it uh, requires open heart surgery. It requires the patient to go on bypass and sometimes you get tissue damage. There is also um, ways to do this minimally invasively with an occluder. The one shown here is an itinol or a metallic uh, double disc design. Uh, but these um, are quite bulky. They can have some issues like friction and conduction block and they don't grow with the child. So the child um, is left with a metallic object permanently in their heart. Um, so we worked on a uh, device to deliver a patch that would encourage tissue ingrowth uh, and would leave no uh, permanent object behind. Um, so it would act as a scaffold so the tissue could repair itself um, and everything would degrade. So it was just natural tissue left behind. And to do this, we used a, a photo curable adhesive that was de developed by a collaborator, Jeff Karp. Um, and we worked closely with a team at Children's, Boston Children's Hospital led by Dr. Pedro Del Lindo. Um, we used two balloons and we used uh, internal light to cure the adhesive on the heart and stick the patch there. This next video will describe this in, in, in detail. Researchers from four top institutions in Boston have designed a specialized catheter that can repair holes in the heart without invasive open heart surgery. First, a clinician inserts the catheter, which is equipped with a UV light and biodegradable adhesive patch, through a vein and guides it to the hole in the patient's heart. Next, the adhesive patch and two balloons, one on each side of the hole, are released from the catheter. The balloons apply pressure from both sides of the heart wall, securing the patch in place. Then, the clinician turns on the catheter's UV light, which reflects off the balloon's interior and activates the glue on the side of the patch facing the heart wall. Finally, the clinician deflates the balloons and removes the catheter, leaving behind the biodegradable patch. In time, tissue will grow over the patch and the patch will dissolve, leaving no foreign material in the body. Okay, so that was an example where we used, um, where we do local repair or replacement of focal deficits. And we have multiple other um, projects ongoing in the lab where instead of augmenting the global organ, we're um, looking at tissue level defects and trying to repair them locally, either with scaffolds, biomaterials, or some mechanical means. The third research strand I'll talk about is uh, that of organosynthetic simulators. So this is where we um, combine tissue uh, with soft robotic techniques to recapitulate the original motion and function of organs. Why would we um, couple organic tissue with soft robots? We've seen a need for um, enhanced test beds for some of the devices and the therapies that we design in the lab and that we're testing out. Uh, here we show a number of different test beds and they all each have their limitations, even though they're very powerful tools. Um, on the left, you see a, um, a, a device or a system that's used for testing uh, heart devices and often heart valves. It can apply the correct flows and pressures that you see in the different heart chambers, but obviously it does not represent the anatomy or the, what the heart looks like. The second from the left is an anatomically accurate um, model, but this is made of silicone, it's passive, it doesn't move, so it's good for uh, demonstrations, but it doesn't recapitulate function. The third are computational models, which we use a lot in the lab. We really um, get a lot out of these computational models, uh, but they're not real physical devices where you can t um, test and train and simulate things on the bench. The fourth is when you take out an organ from um, you know, an animal model or something, and then you connect it to a flow loop. Um, and this has limitations because to make that move, you have to drive it with flow and it stiffens over time so it has a short shelf life. 
So what we want to do is look at um, how we can, you know, recreate um, heart motion, lung, or lung filling and emptying, diaphragm motion, and kind of the interdependence between the heart motion and the lung function on the bench in the lab. So three case studies here. The first is a biorobotic hybrid heart. The second is a respiratory simulator. And the third is a combination of those two. So when we put a, a flow loop within the respiratory simulator and we observe what happens to the blood flow during different phases of breathing. So I'll talk a little through the first one. Here the idea is that we can take uh, a real tissue heart, we can unwrap it in a very specific way. So you basically can unwrap all the muscle on the heart and lay it out in a flat band, uh, which is fascinating. You can then scan that and you can scan it in a way where um, you use a technique called diffusion tensor MRI and you can identify the orientation of the muscles in that band, so the muscle fibers in the heart. And then we have a lot of methods here in the lab to recreate that with soft robotic muscles. So we create a silicone band that has internal pockets and when we pressurize them we get similar motion to the myocardial or the heart muscle band. We can go then and rewrap this synthetic or soft robotic band around a dissected heart and couple them together using a newly developed uh, adhesive. So we're essentially replacing the dead tissue muscle with this soft robotic muscle that we can control fully. We can control the rate, the degree of contraction and everything, and we're coupling them together. So that means that we can keep the uh, internal um, anatomy like the heart valves, all these little cords that um, help the heart valves to move, the structures of the ventricles, the atria, the, the texture and everything. We maintain all that but we um, replace the muscle so that we can reanimate it. To do that we do a lot of different um, casting procedures, we do careful dissection, we uh, cast the outside of the heart with silicone so we have an exact anatomy and we put the dissected heart back in that outer mold and fill in between with silicone so we can get a cast, a silicone cast of the muscle and then we put in these actuators into the, into the muscle using that band um, that I described in the last slide. We also had to do some innovation in order to develop an adhesive to uh, adhere a silicone to tissue. So we developed an adhesive we call tissue sil. Um, here you can see uh, the green on the top of the bar is where the adhesive is interpenetrating into the muscle. On the bottom, the yellow is the adhesive coupling the lighter gray, which is the silicone to the tissue, which is shown here in darker gray. And these are different cross sections of a CT scan. Here is another um, CT scan and you can see this is scanning through the long axis um, view. And you can see the darker gray is the synthetic muscle, the lighter gray is the real tissue. And you can see how well coupled they are together. And then the similarly, when you go from the top down and scan through here, we're in the atrium, the top chambers. When we get down into the ventricles, you can see the inner real tissue and the outer soft robotic synthetic muscle that we can, um, we can control. We can put this in a flow loop as shown schematically here uh, where we have a pump and we have different chambers to control pressures, resistances um, and we can um, create really uh, physiological or lifelike pressures uh, in the ventricles and in the vessels. We can do the same for flow and we can recreate the pressure gradients that happen across these vessels also. So we can really um, get the correct hemodynamics, which is the dynamics of the blood in the heart, um, on the bench with these tools. I'm going to switch into another model, and this is a quick whistle-stop tour of a lot of research, so forgive me if it's, uh, if it's going quickly, but I just wanted to give you a feel for some of the different work that goes on. Um, this is an organosynthetic model of respiratory mechanics. Again, we use some organic tissue and some synthetic um, tissue to, or synthetic uh, material to recreate this. The vision for this model was that we would um, have two compartments, one representing the thorax and one representing the abdomen and they would be separated by a diaphragm. This, in this instance the diaphragm is synthetic. It's driven by artificial muscles that are highly controllable and then we could put 
organic lungs in the upper compartment or the thoracic cavity and surround them by a 3D printed rib cage that's anatomically accurate and based on patient data. This has utility as a teaching tool, so I teach respiratory uh, pathophysiology here at Harvard Medical School. Uh, and here we can use it to visualize what's going on during breathing and measure the pressures and output them in real time. We can always also use it as a training model for mechanical ventilation and as a test bed for testing um, medical devices uh, in the thorax or in the respiratory system. This video shows the function of this and it was also um, exhibited in the, at the Science Gallery in Dublin in Trinity College um, as part of an exhibit called Plastics where um, uh, people visiting could press the button and watch the lungs move. Um, but I'll play this video for you here so you can see the diaphragm moving down and the lungs will inflate and deflate on demand. And that diaphragm is pulled by artificial muscles on the bottom. Um, you can also change various compartments and the properties of them to mimic disease models as well as mimic the healthy, uh, healthy breathing cycle. And this shows some of the tunability. So when we input different pressures to these muscles on the bottom, we get various uh, pressure changes and various degrees of pressure changes in the abdomen, which um, when you breathe in, the pressure in the abdomen gets positive. Um, and the pressure in the thorax actually gets um, negative, so the pleural pressure shown here. And you can tune the degree to which these pressures change based on the input to the artificial muscles. Similarly, you can change the properties of the lungs. Here we just put a mesh around them to make them stiffer uh, or change their elasticity or their compliance. And you can show the effect that has on the amount of flow coming into the lung and going out of the lung and the volume that goes into the lung. Um, so here this this represents compliance. Um, so for, for a very compliant lung, you get more volume into the lung, for example. We also use soft robotics to um, uh, create disease models uh, in vivo, uh, in, in, um, uh, in a live um, animal model. This is a band for aortic stenosis. It goes around the aorta and it can uh, recapitulate uh, disease um, where the aortic valve becomes stenosed or narrowed. Um, this has three pockets that can be pressurized uh, selectively. So you can select which of the pockets you pressurize. Um, and when we do that, you can see here, this is when all pockets are pressurized, when just one is or when two are, you get different cross sections of flow. And then what we can do is we can measure, um, measure what happens in an MRI machine and measure the velocity um, of the flow and how it changes as, as um, it flows through these different cross sections. And this gives us a really nice um, detailed look at the dynamics of the blood flowing through um, different types of uh, disease models. Um, this video will show on the left um, dynamic actuation of this device so you can see how we can pulse it on and off over time and this mimics the valve opening and closing. Um, we can change the rate at which we do that, but we can also change the amount to which we um, increase the pressure in each of these pockets. Uh, so here we're, we're changing the amount of, of air we put into each of the pockets. So you get this kind of asymmetric disease model, which uh, you, you often see in patients that have calcified or degenerated valves. We also use computational modeling tools here. Um, this shows constriction of the aorta and the corresponding um, pressures that happen in the, in the aorta when you um, inflate this to various degrees. In the short axis or in the cross section, you can see a similar effect. And this shows the pockets inflating and deflating and the changes you get in the, in the hemodynamics. We can also take a patient scan and look at, how, at um, how their valve looks for the CT scan. And then we can recreate that exact um, morphology with a patient specific sleeve. So this allows us to do patient specific um, modeling. 
when we do this live, we can uh, change by inflating to various degrees. We can we can change the effective orifice area, so the amount of flow that goes through the valve. And we can also change what's called the PV loop on the bottom right, which is the pressure volume loop of the ventricle as it contracts with every heartbeat. And we can change this from baseline uh, all the way up to this very pointed PV loop. Um, which um, shows that you have really high pressures, um, really high volumes, but small output with each uh, with each heartbeat. So, uh, really getting at replicating the um, disease that comes when these valves become uh, narrow. The final um, part of my talk is about computational models. And these models are used for each of these research strands. So across all of the research strands that I've just discussed, um, global organ um, augmentation, local tissue repair, and these benchtop simulators, we use computational modeling tools. I won't go into detail about all these models, but just to give a snapshot of some of them. Um, here is a model of a valve. On the left is healthy. This re blue represents the blood flowing, going through the valve. And on the right is a, a mitral valve where there's regurgitation. There's a lot of backflow you can see there. So that valve isn't closing correctly and that has clinical effects. But we can replicate that really accurately with this computational model. You can see the cords there and the leaflets and we can really re recapitulate all of those. Uh, we can also look at drug delivery. Here we look at drug delivery directly into the heart from a device pla placed on the outside of the heart and we look how that diffuses into the tissue. Um, this helps us to guide uh, design of drug delivery devices, for example, where we place them, uh, how many we need, what the dosing uh, regime should be. Okay, um, I'll finish up there with a, our vision. So the vision for the group is um, to come up with new approaches for su supporting and repairing organs with intrinsic mechanical function. Uh, to do this, we design solutions which adhere to and integrate technology into the inherent complex biomechanics of the tissue. We do this by virtue of better matching and supporting native organ function. With that, I'll finish up. I'd like to thank um, the funders of this work. Again, I'd like to thank the group that have um, done this work, and I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. And thank you for listening. Ellen, thank you so much. That was an absolutely fascinating and, and an inspiring overview of the research programs that you've been you've been leading. Um, and it's clear that your work on augmenting dynamic organ functions with uh, the development of medical devices, you know, has the potential to be to be truly transformational. Um, I'd be interested just to understand a little bit more um, of your journey um, and maybe get a sense of, you know, what really inspired you at the early stages of your career to start work on, on medical devices to support organ support. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a very specific area that, that you're working on and, 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 and we'll be keen just to understand, you know, what was the, what was the glimmer that, um, that, that caught your imagination? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think um, during my kind of school education and college education, I was very interested in the intersection of medicine and engineering, um, uh, specifically like mechanical engineering and design with, uh, with you know, how we could improve health. Um, and naturally, I think that led me towards organs that have mechanical function like the heart. And the heart was fascinating to me. I think really I um, I got into it when I was in college because my um, work placement in college was in a cardiovascular medical device um, company uh, where we were designing filters um, to uh, catch emboli or any particles that had dislodged when a patient got a stent to open up their vessels. Um, and there I learned really in depth about the heart and how it functions and how things can go wrong with the heart and how important it is to, you know, treat them, treat these uh, pathologies there. You know, there's like electrical pathologies that happen to the heart with the rhythm, but there's very mechanical things that can go wrong with blocked vessels or with muscle dysfunction. Um, and it seemed to me that there was a lot of 
um, in innovation that could go into solutions, uh, non non pharmacological solutions, uh, where you could you know, put something in the heart, like a stent to open a vessel or replace the heart valve or put something around the heart to help it pump or design a pump to help the heart to pump. So really have like, you know, machines and devices working with the native heart function to improve um, its, it, to improve its function and, uh, and eventually to preserve quality of life and to extend life. Um, that to me was really attractive and then when I got more into it, I realized we could apply some of these technologies beyond the heart so we could look at, you know, different muscles that are moving like the diaphragm, like I spoke about today. Um, so I think it was a combination of my education and then my exposure to these types of devices in industry. And then during my PhD, I built on that and integrated kind of new technologies into, um, this, um, into similar devices. Thank you, Ellen. And I mean, it's clear from, from your presentation and, and just all of the, the rich detail that you've shared with us um, that your research really does have the opportunity to um, improve quality of life, to extend life and, and really deliver significant patient benefits. Um, are you able to share with us whether um, products have been tested in, in human patients yet? Yeah, so um, we're really early stage at the moment. Um, I have worked on devices in industry that have been, um, you know, implanted in humans. The closest uh, we have from the lab at the moment is this heart patch I showed you, which is um, we license technology to a company and they are pursuing it for a slightly different defect, but they are due to uh, implant it in patients. Um, next year in 2023 planned so uh, there's a startup company working on that and they're doing extensive testing to get regulatory approval so hopefully that will uh, be able to be clinically implemented next year. Fantastic thank you and I wish you all the best with uh, with, with, with that work in, in terms of uh, clinical trials. Um, we're, we're getting some questions coming through from the audience, but could I just ask everybody um, if uh, you have any reflections or questions from what you've heard already today, then please drop them in the chat and um, and we have some time to be able to um, take some, some time to discuss with, with, with Ellen um, as we go through the session. Um, I, it'd be interesting just, just to understand a little bit more about that um, sort of journey, if you like, from bench through to uh, through to patients, um, and what you yeah. see, Ellen, as being some of the biggest challenges to to enable you to translate these medical devices. Yeah, um, that's a great question. I think you know it takes a really good interdisciplinary team to do this. I think you need engineers, but you also need clinical collaborators, um, and then to commercialize it you need cross-functional teams there's a lot of work in <clears throat> quality and regulatory because as well as designing these devices and showing they work you really have to ensure that they're manufactured to a high standard and they're repeatable and you do the right level of testing um, to get them through uh, approval regulatory bodies here like the FDA um, and various notified bodies in your and that takes a lot of work from a wider team um, so that can be challenging because it's very rigorous as it should be um, to ensure that you know when this does go to patients that the devices are safe um, <clears throat> but it can be challenging to meet these uh, regulatory requirements. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and we've got we've got a question coming through from uh, from the audience. So Laurie is asking, um, you know, regarding your biorobotic hybrid heart, uh, how soon do you think this will replace the need for donors in heart transplant op yeah. operations? Um, and you know, can you see similar technology being used then for for other organs in in the way that you were just describing? Yeah, that's a great um, question. So. Um, I think that device we still need to get approval for, um, so it's a couple of years away from uh, replacing transplants 
Um, but I think, you know, this is a sleeve that goes on the heart and the heart, the native heart stays there. There are also groups working on total artificial hearts using similar technologies. And the goal there is that they would be used instead of transplants. Uh, I'm sure you all heard about the recent implant of a pig heart in a man. Um, this would be slightly different where you could use aspects of, um, of uh, you know, like real tissue or tissue engineered internal parts and then use uh, muscles for the outer part and this could have a very um, long life, very tunable and could, if successful, uh, replace the need for um, donors and heart transplants and could be much more scalable. Um, I don't think it's going to happen tomorrow, but, but you know, um, a couple of years um, from now, potentially. So in, in the com complex medical world, actually, a couple of years is pretty soon. So uh, we, we look forward to, to, to hearing <laughs> yeah. more about this. Yeah, that's yeah, probably brilliant. optimistic too, but yeah, <laughs> working. <laughs> uh, you've, you've, you've clearly got a strong vision and, and, and I have to say, you know, it's um, j just from a, from, from a, a layperson perspective, um, it's just amazing to, to be able to see everything that, that you and, and the team have been able to, 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 to develop. Um, how have you built your team? So how, how do you ensure that you've kind of got the right mix of, of people and the right locations and how important has MIT been on, on your journey? Yeah, that's a great question as well. I really, um, you know, I said I'm lucky to work with the team. I think it's key to have um, a mix of different skill sets within the group. Um, so I have some mechanical engineers that are purely, you know, um, engineers and are learning about the biological side of things, but uh, do some really advanced engineering. And then there are um, some um, students and trainees that are much more on the biological side and they look at the you know the interaction between the host and the device um, I think then we look at material scientists we have people that are really focused on the materials um, we have um, you know some within the group there are designers and pharmacists and material scientists chemical engineers um, mechanical engineers and, and bioengineers and then we also have we work really closely with surgeons and interventionalists and we have some in the mo at the moment in the group that are doing research full time um, but really co-designing with the end user uh, I think is, is really key. Um, and then often we get interested students that have themselves had some sort of heart condition potentially have co could have had you know um, repair when they were kids or babies and um, we you know had a student that he himself was a recipient of a heart transplant and did amazing work um, and is now going on to be a pediatric cardiac surgeon so you know we have a range of people and they really uh, are all so passionate about working towards these goals and combine their very diverse expertise and background um, so I think that interdisciplinarity and diversity is, is key in growing the right team. And it sounds like collaboration is, is, is a key message there in terms of bringing um, the right people together at the right time just to move things forward. Absolutely. Fantastic. Yes. Yeah. 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 So I'm sure that um, lots of, 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 well, young women, I'm sure actually lo lots of people listening to your presentation today would, would find it incredibly inspiring um, and, um, and, and will be intrigued to have learned of everything that, that you have, have achieved. Um, what advice would you give a student that may be considering STEM research? Um, and if you were to look back a few years, are there things that you, you, may, have, um, you may have done differently or are there things that um, you've been incredibly proud of that, um, that have enabled you to make the, the strides that you've clearly made in, in recent years? Yeah, um, I would encourage anybody thinking of going into STEM um, to go for it. It's, it's so rewarding and it's such a um, interesting career. You, you know, you get a lot out of it. There's never a dull moment. There's always something new to learn or to explore. And so it's highly rewarding in that regard. Um, I think engineering um, has traditionally been, you know, male dominated. I think that's changing. Um, and I think that, you know, women are becoming um, 
you know, much more prevalent in, in the engineering world and just as, um, as competent. And I think, you know, there's, you asked me about like what I would change. I definitely um, have been busy recently with a young family and with a career, uh, but I wouldn't change it at all. It's, um, it's a privilege to be able to do both and to have a family life and a career. And I wouldn't be able to do it without the support of the team and the support structures in place here to do it, um, but it can be done. So I think I would encourage anybody um, that wants to <laughs> wants to do both that you know um, find the right support network and uh, and go for it. Fantastic, fantastic. So thanks very much, Ellen. Um, I think that's all the questions that we have from from around the the, the audience today. Um, and it just leaves me to to thank you so much for uh, for taking the time to join us and, and really sharing both your journey and providing such a great insight into the work that you've been doing and the devices that you've been developing. It, 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 I wish you all the luck with 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 your uh, your, your future endeavours. Um, and really keen to, uh, to to read more about your work as we see some of these products um, being made available to uh, to patients and and really support supporting the, the, the extension of life and, uh, and, and, and improved quality of life. So thank you so very, very much. Um, to the audience, I'd just really like to thank you for joining us this afternoon um, for what was the last session of this Wales MIT virtual conference series. Um, I hope the session has presented you with some amazing insight into into Ellen's work and, um, and, and has inspired you uh, this afternoon. If you'd like to get in touch, um, then you're absolutely welcome to drop us a line and um, we would really, really look forward to hearing from you and um, the email address will be posted into the chat. So thank you very much for your time and your attention and um, look forward to hearing from you and, uh, and goodbye for now. Thank you. Au revoir.